welcome to Fertility and Sterility on Air, the podcast where you can stay current on the latest global research in the field of reproductive medicine. This podcast brings you an overview of this month's journal, in-depth discussion with authors, and other special features. FNS on Air is brought to you by Fertility and Sterility Family of Journals in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and is hosted by Dr. Kurt Barnhart, Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eve Feinberg, Editorial Editor, Dr. Micah Hill, Media Editor, and Dr. Pietro Bordaletto, Interactive Associate-in-Chief. Hello and welcome everyone to Fertility and Sterility on Air. It's September 2023, Volume 120, Number 3. Kurt and Eve, this is a special one. This is our third birthday. This is the start of our fourth uh, season of Fertility and Sterility on Air. I didn't know. I would have baked a cake. (laughs) Yeah, I actually had no idea. I thought it was October with ASRM, but that makes perfect sense because we started it before ASRM that year. Happy birthday, FNS. Happy birthday. I was thinking of all the things that have happened in uh, three and a half years. I mean, Eve, you were president of SRI during COVID. Remember that? And and do we stay open? Do we not? Like those were the decisions you've made during that time. Kurt, you've become editor in chief of the the journal. I've survived a big medical thing. We've all had kids graduate. I won't say what they've graduated from, but we've all had kids (laughs) graduate. Pietro's had both of his kids with his wife during that time and finished uh, his fellowship and is now faculty up at Harvard and at uh, Boston IVF. So that's a lot that's happened in th- in three years for us. Yeah, it's been a it's been a big three and a half years or big three years. So time, yeah, time really marches on. But uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, and thank you to all of the loyal listeners and hopefully the new ones as well. Yeah, and especially like Kurt said, thank you to our listeners. Uh, This summer, we passed over 50,000 downloads and listens to the podcast, so none of this would be possible without our listeners, and we want to thank you for tuning in each month. I also want to give a special shout out to our listeners in Australia. I had the special pleasure of going down for a meeting, and it was a pleasure to learn that we have so many listeners in Australia. So, hi, everyone. It's wonderful that, that Fertility and Serility and our podcast has such an international reach. Bring it on, more. (laughs) Outstanding. So we're going to start this month with the views and reviews. So this month, it comes from our editorial editor, uh, Ruben Alvaro. He's talking about the no man's land of non-tubal ectopic and cesarean section scar pregnancies. And he's recruited uh, two sets of authors from this. The first uh, looks at the basic uh, overview of diagnosis and treatment of non-tubal ectopics. And this is written by a prominent group of uh, reproductive surgeons that are out there. The second one looks specifically at uh, cesarean scar ectopics and sort of the nuance of whether it's in the defect or on the defect uh, and how to manage those and is written by a group of experts from MFM. Uh, But Ruben uh, concludes his introduction of the topic by saying non-tubal ectopics and C-section scar pregnancies remain a no man's land with multiple specialties vying for and trying to care for these dangerous conceptions. Given that REIs are uniquely positioned to both diagnose and treat these pregnancies at a very early stage and are committed to fertility preservation, we should take the field to the benefit of our patients. And I I like that. Uh, I don't know if it's the same way for you guys, but at least in our academic center at our hospital, uh, certainly the REIs are the ones brought in to manage these um, procedurally or surgically for those reasons that Ruben lays out. Is it the same at at your places, Kurt and Eve? It's it's interesting that it, I agree, it's a battle and REI has, like many other aspects of REI, has been kind of letting it go. Um, I think we're uniquely qualified to be able to handle this. We handle early pregnancy, we handle atopic pregnancies, but for some reason, maybe because it's just not common enough, it becomes a skill set that is kind of given to others and and MFM seems to come into the vacuum. But it surprises me when I hear that an MFM colleague, you know, tried to put a needle into a small sack and struggled with it when like, that's that's what we do. I mean, <laughs> we, we could have done that, you know, very easily. But right. um, I don't know what happens at Northwestern Eve. We help out with a lot of them, but MFM does as well as does MIGS for some of the corneal or more tricky ectopic pregnancies. But we have a cervical pregnancy that we're helping to manage right now, so I think it just depends on uh, the situation and the circumstance. So a good set of views and reviews from Ruben. And then we have an Inklings as our only other front matter in the journal this month. This one is not from an editorial editor, but from one of our editor-in-chiefs of a sister journal from Ann Steiner. And she talks about planned oocyte cryopreservation, to thaw or not to thaw. 
And uh, obviously, Anne is very uniquely positioned with the type of research she's done and the amount she's done looking at ovarian reserve and AMH and uh, looking at oocyte cryo models. And, and really what she talks through here is a thought exercise and all the complicated decision making that needs to go into counseling a patient on uh, when and whether to thaw uh, those eggs and when to when to not and when to try on their own. And she was going into such detail, I thought she was almost going to give us a formula that we could plug in and just and model it and spit out a number. But I think that was kind of the point is that it's so complex, we really can't do that. Uh, but it takes time. It takes time to sit down with the patients and talk through all of these uh, complex considerations and whether or not to, uh, one, to freeze eggs up front um, for medical fertility preservation or non, non-medically indicated fertility preservation, uh, but then also when to come back and use those eggs. And so that is the front matter of the journal. Uh, Kurt and Eve, any thoughts on that before we move on to the original research? As always, I think it's great content. So, um, you know, please just don't take our word for it. Take a look at the journal. Yes, exactly. And then, Kurt, we're jumping right into the seminal contribution. I know it's something everybody's interested in. Tell us about ChatGPT. Thank you, Micah. I, I was really excited to see this one as, and um, happy to uh, uh, select it as a seminal contribution because I think it is it's got broad implications just beyond the, the data in this paper. And I think we all need to learn a little bit about artificial intelligence and, and in this particular case, the chat GPT. So this is a paper, first author is um, Joseph Chevernak and the senior author is um, Sangeeta Jindal. The title is The Promise and Peril of Using Large Language Model to Obtain Clinical Information. Chat GPT performs strongly as a fertility counseling tool with limitations. This is a neat study. It's not exceptionally difficult. The methodology is not deep, but it really does make us think a little bit about ChatGPT. Eve and Micah, have you got on the bad wagon yet? Are you using ChatGPT? Yeah. I mean, I I use it more in the sense of playing around with it. Like I had, I asked it to help write a letter of recommendation for somebody that I had to write that was not like a critical letter. It was for um, it was for an award, and it was super helpful just to help pull out the framework and some of the sentence structure of how to how to do that. Um, and I've played around with it a lot in the fertility space in terms of asking it questions and seeing what comes out. Yeah, the the idea is that it can you can search with it and find you know at the tip of your fingers very quickly some some comprehensive information and this paper is really looking into is the information comprehensive enough and is it accurate enough Um, but let's go back a little bit micah do you even understand how ai works it took me a long time to figure out this black box i'm still not sure i understand it i don't kurt this is something that i know uh you know i struggle with a lot and especially as more and more articles come out on this as a a reader and a learner of these articles you know what do i take away from them i I rolled up my sleeves a little bit and tried to get a primer on what the heck this is and um i've listened to a a, a couple podcasts on myself obviously podcasts are the only way to learn in our environment and uh in a simple terms the 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 geeks i've talked to said that what ai is is that they use the whole wealth of all the written words to train a computer to basically say, what's the next word in the sentence? So really what you're doing is is looking at huge statistical models to say, what's more likely, what have people said in the past, and what's next? And I find that fascinating that you probably can figure out with pretty good mathematical probability, if the first word is fertility, the next word might be something in that field. But how it decides that and how it learns is is the real mystery here. So there's a couple of concepts that we have to get through. If you're going to ask ChatGPT to say, tell me about fertility, one, you're wondering, where did it get the information? And two, because it really is a computer, it can't tell you where the information that it was trained on is the good information or the bad information. Is it it, um, faulty information or is it accurate information? And occasionally, as the authors put in an introduction to this paper, it can hallucinate, which is an interesting concept. So the computer can perseverate, for lack of a better word, saying, I'm really not sure what the next word is, and it starts to go off on a path where it, um, on its own. Now, that, I'm told, is the heart of AI. The fact that the computer can start going off on its own is the, is the whole idea of like learning. But the question is, can it actually go off in the right direction, the wrong direction? And the second big category that these authors bring out in introduction is that it's learning from material, and it can't tell which material is the best material. There's something called zero-shot or one-shot GPT writing, where you're not telling it what to look at. You're not saying, write me um, an article about fertility 
from the CDC or just saying, write me an article about fertility, which is what our patients will do. So it doesn't know that, that the CDC is of greater value than what it finds on Facebook. So it can, it can give you bad information. And there's this whole analogy that it can lead to misinformation. And that's the point of this paper. I think there's two types of misinformation. Like if you're comparing a computer to a person, there's intentional misinformation. There's clearly intentional misinformation in our world. But then there's like not intentional misinformation. And, and I'm thinking like if, if you ask me my fertility practices, I would have bias but um, and maybe passive misinformation. Maybe I'm overhyping my, my program. Maybe I have a, a bias that, I, that this treatment worked before. Um, so the question is, does the computer have any of this? So before I spill the beans, what, what do you guys think of that? Do you think the computer is going to get it right or, or not? I mean, I think sometimes it'll get it right or probably often it'll get it right and sometimes it'll get it wrong. Yeah. And, and the question is, is if patients are using chat GPT and they get it wrong, then you've got this whole problem of this concept that we kind of, we as human beings cling to information the first time we see it. We put greater stock in learning something the first time. And there's a lot of literature that says that convincing somebody against their first impression is really, really hard to do. In other words, we think when someone tells us something, I shouldn't have said someone tells us something, when we learn something, when we read it, when a computer tells us, when our family and friends tell us, that we give them credibility. And then to convince me that that, was, that information was wrong and I should change my mind is far harder. And since misinformation is gets around the web a lot faster than real information, there's a very good chance the computer is going to come up with the misinformation rather than the good information. And that was the whole point of this study. So it looked at basically 17 questions from the Center of Disease Control's website and a couple other very good sources like the Cardiff Fertility Knowledge Scale and the Fertility Infertility Treatment and Knowledge Score, as well as, lo and behold, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine Committee Opinion on Optimizing Natural Fertility. It basically took the CDC's questions, 17 frequently asked questions and asked the computer and said, give me an answer. And then it correlated to see how accurate those answers were. It is interesting. You should look at the paper. Just don't take my word for it. But it looked at a number of factors that I'm going to unfortunately summarize and not do justice. It worked you know, for the words response. It worked at something called the sentiment analysis uh, polarity, the objectivity, the total factual statements, and the rate at which the um, statements were incorrect or referenced. By the way, that's something I didn't learn about ChatGPT. It will make up references for you. Literally make them up, not find them. Make them up. Just put them in the format of reference. So you really have to be careful of what it says. The good news was, I guess there's a lot of good information about fertility out on the web. So it, and ultimately, ChatGPT did a pretty good job of summarizing the answer to these questions. It would have um, scored very highly on uh, an 87 percentile using something called the Bunting's 2013 International Cohort or the 95th percentile for something about the Cotasia's 27. 2017 cohort for fertility and fertility treatment. So good news, ChatGPT did answer these questions on natural fertility and you know how long does it take to conceive and questions about age accurately. What do you do with that information? So we've got this right, but just, do you still trust it? Not yet. <laughs> And, and why is that? What's what's holding you back? I mean, I think that these were very specific questions to which there are answers that could be readily searched. So I think for very simple things, statistics, percentages, I think that's that's OK. I, I don't what where I struggle to understand is what is the difference between this and a Google search in terms of the information that you get out has to be the information that is put in and the sources are not that dissimilar. And so I think it's it's reasonable to think that you could hunt down and find some simplified fertility information on the internet. Where I wouldn't trust it is if you were to input the question of, let's take Ann Steiner's brilliant inklings from earl earlier this month. Should I warm my eggs? Should I not warm my eggs? Like, I don't think the chat GPT is ready for prime time in terms of patient counseling. I think that it could probably generate some very simplified educational materials. That's fine. That might save some time. But where I think that the real value is going to be in the future, and we're not there yet, is in providing personalized medicine and individualized counseling, which would be amazing to be able to ask the computer some pretty intelligent questions and get some pretty intelligent counseling out. We're just not there.
I, I had the same kind of thoughts on it, Eve. Congratulations. I mean, that, that was well said. I think what, what it's saying now is that it can, it can summarize information pretty quickly and pretty easily, and it might actually bring them the bottom up. In other words, you can get pretty good generic information pretty easily, maybe faster than you can do it in Google, depending on your, on your search techniques and things like that. But what I don't think it's ready for is its ability to, to think, even though it's called artificial intelligence. You know, what do I do in this situation? There was a great analogy that I didn't know artificial intelligence future models, ones they're still working on, can actually seem to think. Um, the, the test question, I have to share the story that they asked was, um, if two people, let's say you're in a room and Jack and John have a cat and Jack puts the cat in a box and then John comes in later and puts the cat into the basket. The question was, what to, where does John think the cat is and where does Jack think the cat is? Because the computer shouldn't know that there's different perspectives on this. Right? It should just know what happened. And believe it or not, further advances, ChatPT could answer the question, say, well, Jack thinks it's in the box because that's where he put it, but John thinks it's in the basket because he knows he moved it. The cat doesn't care, and the boxes are sentient be are not sentient beings, so they don't know where the cat is. And it was just it was very clever that that artificial intelligence could could quote unquote think like that. So please learn more about artificial intelligence, but I agree, Eve, don't let people ask questions about, you know, do I throw my eggs or what's my, maybe, maybe it can get an estimate of what's my success rate, but, you know, not what's my best treatment and then should I have another cycle? We're not there yet. I completely agree. And I think back to my earlier question about how does it differ from a Google search? Well, I mean, I think the biggest difference is that it synthesizes the material and it comes up with written paragraphs and summaries. So unlike Google, which will take you to the CDC website or will take you to the ASRM website, ChatGPT, if you ask it a concrete question, it will literally type out paragraphs of information within seconds to minutes. And so it synthesizes that information into human language, it uses some of those artificial neural networks to create human language to make it more digestible. So it is very fun to play around with, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And it is the different iterations of ChatGPT, I think are only going to get better. And they used an earlier version for this manuscript. I also want to highlight, we interviewed Kiri Belby from the UK at Esray, who did somewhat of a similar study looking at fertility information that's on the internet, looking specifically at could you have your patient education materials be written by ChatGPT? And they had sort of a similar finding. There was pretty good information out there, and it's not quite ready for prime time, but it's getting close. So I think more work in this area is going to come. And I think that as these models get trained, we're going to need input from reproductive medicine specialists to help train these models to say, this is relevant, this is not. And I think to the point of false references, that's super scary for anyone who's really trying to use GPT for any serious work. That's a threat. Micah, you and I have talked about this when our conference calls for fertility and sterility about how chat GPT should be used in medical publishing. Um, I'm curious on how you summarize your thoughts on that. Yeah, I've thought a lot about it, Kurt. I, I haven't messed around personally with chat GPT to your earlier question, but we've certainly read a lot of, about it from a medical literature standpoint. I, I think it's okay to use for if people want to try to use it to help generate an, an introduction, especially to, to a uh, paper or maybe a specific paragraph to a paper. I, I think that you need to read it incredibly careful as a content expert. So you're using it as a tool, much like you might use Microsoft Word's grammar help in your sentence construction. I think you need to not trust any references that it gives you at all. Uh, but if you want to use it to help generate content and then edit down significantly from there, I, I think that's probably okay. I, I haven't gotten to the point where I trust it yet or enough to try it. And then, I, you know, at least where Elsevier has come down to is that it should be acknowledged in the paper. Uh, I think there's good consensus that ChatGPT should not be listed as an author. Some people have said it should be listed as an author, and I think the most what of what I read out there is that uh, that's that would be inappropriate. But it should probably be acknowledged, and the author should be very careful when using it. 
Yeah, I'm comfortable with that too. I think that if it helps you be comprehensive in your introduction or come up with a point in your discussion you didn't think about, that's great. But chat GPT should not generate data. You know it can generate graphs. You can tell it plot this versus this. Um, and, and it should not generate data. It should not generate references. That's inappropriate. Is it helping you understand the topic in a quick and easy way? Great. But it's just a tool. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be primary way that you're getting information. One really good use of chat GPT I've also found is for writing learning objectives. <laughs> it takes all those blooms taxonomy words and really helps you to apply it for a specific subject. So <laughs> when writing uh, grand rounds or another lecture, check it out. It's it's kind of fun to use. I love that, Eve. I always have that list open on one computer screen just so I can pull the right. <laughs> language. Yeah, over. the right taxonomy. Yeah. yeah. I've I've been playing around with it a fair amount just to find out where is it useful and where is it not. So lots of fun uses. My final thought on the paper, Kurt, I, I was the good shepherd on that optimizing natural fertility document. So I spent a lot of time wordsmithing the the answers to those questions. I wanted the authors to actually tell us what chat GPT came up with, but they didn't. They just said it was consistent. They don't actually give us the text. I wanted to see if all the hours spent nuancing wordsmithing that document, if chat GPT did even better, because you know, I don't like to think the computer could could beat us yet, but I, I yeah. would have wanted to see it. <laughs> Well, again, read the paper. Joseph Chevernack and uh, Sangeeta Jindal are the authors, but there's a fabulous reflection um, that you should just read about ChatGPT in general. Um, the comments on the paper, of course, but and, but gives you a real overview by uh, Andrew Hamilton, Michael Goldstein, and Joshua Combs. And these are our resident experts for artificial intelligence for the journal, and they did a nice job explaining it in plain English. So please take a read. All right, so I have our next article moving on to assisted reproduction. Uh, this one's called Elevated Serum Progesterone Levels Before Frozen Embryo Transfer Do Not Negatively Impact Reproductive Outcomes, a large retrospective cohort. This is from authors in Spain uh, who have done a lot of studies looking at progesterone and progesterone levels in FETs. So essentially what they're looking at is, is you know, this is the European model using uh, vaginal progesterone, not intramuscular progesterone and commonly measuring progesterone levels in frozen embryo cycles prior to doing the transfer, mainly to make sure the levels aren't too low. Uh, a lot of European literature showing low progesterone levels using vaginal uh, are associated with poor outcomes. But these authors cite some prior studies uh, that suggest that maybe also high progesterone levels are associated with uh, abnormal outcomes and FET cycles. They don't really go through the biologic plausibility of that, and we'll maybe talk about that as we get to the end. But so they're, they're essentially looking for an association. So is high progesterone the day before your frozen blast transfer associated with poor outcomes? There's not really threshold set for what high progesterone might be. So they decided to look at the 90th and 95th percentiles as well, do a decile analysis. Uh, because this was a retrospective cohort, they had to make some decisions on what their patient population was. They essentially went with all of their FET cycles, which means we have a little bit of heterogeneity. These are patients, about a third of whom had PGT, about a third of whom were donors, kind of all mixed in there. And then the other big confounder potentially in the study is that if they had a low serum progesterone on day four, they gave them a rescue sub-Q dose. So they decided to use logistic regression since they had this very heterogeneous patient population and controlled for the appropriate confounders. They also did subgroup analyses uh, to try to make sure uh, these different subgroups weren't driving the results. And they did something else that I liked called uh, general additive models, which are a different way of looking at linear models to see if there's a nonlinear relationship. So perhaps progesterone is bad if it's both too low and too high on the day before your FET. This would be a type of model that would help you detect that sort of uh, inverted U shape. So they had 3,100 patients. And no matter how they looked at their data, there was no association with high serum progesterone on the day before your embryo transfer with negative outcomes. And this was true when they looked by deciles, when they looked at 90th percentile, 95th percentile, and when they looked at all their subgroup analyses. So overall, it was very reassuring paper, the largest study to be done to this point. My main critique, and it took me until the third read to sort of figure out why this was bothering me, they included patients who had just vaginal progesterone and patients who had vaginal and the added sub-Q. The patients with the added sub-Q had higher serum progesterone levels. To me, that should have been the opposite because the ones they added sub-Q were the ones with low. 
and they rescued them. It's it's just one sentence in the discussion that says that they remeasure those patients the following day on day five, and that was the value they used for that group. So one group has a day four, another group a day five. And they did a nice job in the sub-analyses of breaking it out and still not finding any association, which is reassuring. When you start to talk about the biologic plausibility of why progesterone would be bad, right? It's progestational. It should be good. We're talking about the day before an embryo transfer. We want it to be high. The only biologic plausibility in the papers that are out there is perhaps if it's high too early, you're going to advance the endometrium quicker. We don't actually have good evidence of that. Once you're sort of over a pretty low progesterone threshold, you'll start triggering advancement. So it doesn't appear to be that, that it's too high. It's just that it starts too early would be bad. But potentially by taking this cohort who represent the patients at the lowest 90th percentile and then supplementing them, they're now moving them up to the highest 90th percentile and then taking that value the next day that's high. And so I think that muddied the study a little bit, but I think they did a good job again with all these sub-analyses and the regression modelings and the data was consistent throughout it. So I think that's a critique in, in from my standpoint on the design. I still think this was a really nice study. And when it comes down to it, I don't think the authors felt this study needed to be done, but there's three or four small studies out there that show an association. Notably, one of those authors found the opposite association in a different paper they published also from their observational data. And the ones that have found an association are small studies. So there might be uh, some type one error risk there. And so they, I think they went about it in a good way. We have a large data set. We're going to slice our data every way we can to try to get to the quote unquote truth. And I think this data is reassuring with what we would think is biologically plausible, that your progesterone should be at least at a th certain threshold by the time you're getting your embryo transfer. But too high is probably not a bad thing. Eve, Kurt? That's interesting because we, we've gone from too low. I mean, it's a logical conclusion. We, we're looking at too low. We should look at too high. And I bet there is too high to some degree, especially if the timing, but I, I'm reassured that, you know, this, this data is, is good. Too much is not always better. In this case, it might be that too much doesn't have harm, but in many other things we do, that might not be the case, right? You know, too much gonadotropins isn't always a good thing. Too high in estrogen during your program cycles is not necessarily a good thing. So I, I just want us to understand what this tells us and what it doesn't tell us. Yeah, I also think that the range of progesterone levels that they saw in this manuscript was not particularly high on the high end. And when you compare that to progesterone levels that you see like in a fresh IVF cycle. I've had patients who have complained of bloating, this, that, the other. They want to get off their shots. And I've checked progesterone levels sometimes in patients who are on who have an ongoing pregnancy. And these progesterone levels can be as high as 90, 100, 110. Um, and these patients have ongoing pregnancy levels. So I'm I'm not certain A that I really believe that high progesterone is bad. It is ultimately produced by the placenta or by the trophectoderm cells. And so I, I don't know that there's a biologic plausibility for too high being bad. I think second is that the window that you see both with vaginal and sub-Q when you're only on sub-Q for a day, like it's not that high of a range. The other point, and this is kind of like a minor point, but I thought the title was a little bit misleading. Like the title is Elevated Progesterone Levels Before Frozen Embryo Transfer. And when I think of elevated progesterone levels, I think of premature elevation. And so when I started reading the paper, I was a little bit confused on like, oh, they're not talking about prematurely elevated levels. They're talking about the 95th percentile of, of high progesterone levels, which just weren't that high. That's a good point, because if you, you're just scanning the titles, you might, might have been misled. Yeah, I thought the same thing. But uh, overall, I think, you know, this is a study that had to be done because there's not a great answer in the literature. So I think I tend to agree with Eve more on the biologic plausibility that I, I think it's probably not going to be harmful even at high ranges uh, unless it's premature. But, I, you know, there's enough data out there and people that saying it is that I think a study like this had to be done and they did as good of a job as I think you can do with, with cohort data. So they should be, really be applauded for that. I'd actually love to read the methodologic reviews that went back and forth and just see how they got there because I, I think that was exceptional. Yeah. I just, again, reiterating the same point I made, I just don't want clinicians or that are, that are practicing just to be sloppy. Just just because in this particular instance, there's perhaps no such thing as too much progesterone. That doesn't mean we can overdose people in every other aspect of reproductive <laughs> care. So, right. I, you know, just be careful. Well stated. Well stated, Kurt. All right, Eve, you're on uh, for our next one, looking at Bologna versus Poseidon criteria. Tell us about that. Yeah, this was a retrospective study of patients who underwent IVF with PGT. And the primary outcome was the likelihood of achieving at least one euploid blastocyst for transfer. 
And the exposure was the um, poor ovarian reserve designation. And they compared classification systems by the Bologna criteria with the Poseidon criteria. And as you probably know, the Bologna criteria was established by ESHRAE in 2011. And this sought to identify a group of patients that had a poor prognosis. And they wanted to do this in order to homogenize the population of patients being selected for research. The Bologna criteria takes into account age, AFC, AMH, and response to STEM in a prior cycle, and it has very strict cutoffs. And in fact, this strict cutoff was criticized for being too strict. And subsequently, a group of researchers and clinicians from seven countries then convened to establish Poseidon. (laughs) I don't love the name, but it stands for Patient oriented strategies encompassing individual oocyte number classification. And so what the newer system does, it subdivides poor responders into four groups using age, ovarian reserve markers, prior response, and stage four is the worst category that you can have. And so what they did in this cycle was they took 6,889 PGTA cycles from nearly 5,000 patients between 2019 and 2011, who were included in the analysis. And I think an important point here that we'll touch upon later is only cycles that progressed to retrieval were included in this analysis. Canceled cycles were not accounted for. Clinical and laboratory data were extracted, and each classification system was applied to each patient for each cycle. And the main outcome measure was the percentage of cycles in in which one euploid embryo was available for transfer. So here's what the authors found, and I think it's it's really good for counseling. So patients who fulfilled the Bologna criteria had a 32% chance of having at least one euploid blast in a cycle. When using the Poseidon criteria, there was a linear drop in percentage of achieving a euploid blast from group one to group four. And in fact, the authors did not see a difference between patients classified in group one and patients without poor ovarian reserve And they argue that Poseidon should be revised to eliminate group one. In group two, three, and four, these patients were 78% likely to achieve a single euploid blast, 71% and 44% respectively. And so I think the take-home point from this paper, and I really, I love it, is that Poseidon can offer a more nuanced pre-cycle counseling regarding the likelihood of achieving a euploid blast based on patient characteristics. However, I think the real issue is that patients don't necessarily always want to know the likelihood of a euploid blast, though I think it's important for counseling. They want to know whether they're actually going to have a baby. And because these data don't address the issue of canceled cycles, we can't exactly counsel patients on how many cycles they will need to get to that one euploid blast, which I think would actually be the most important counseling nugget that I could tell a patient. We also reviewed data last month showing that a euploid blast from a younger patient will have a slightly higher live birth rate than a euploid blast from an older patient. So I think we need to be really measured in how we counsel patients that a euploid blast is not a surrogate marker for live birth, but it's an intermediate step. And I think the final point worth mentioning, and for all of you who have been listening to me for like three years, you'll appreciate this. They found that age was still the most important predictive factor. And as I always say, age is queen. Micah, Kurt, what do you think? Don't challenge Eve on age is queen. That's a good one. (laughs) Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, your points are all perfect. It, it, was a, it was a really nice study. It's nice to see these criteria, you know, down the road reevaluated to see if they're actually measuring what we hope they do. And, I, you know, I think part of these criteria is more for standardization of research, but it's also good for counseling patients. And so looking and seeing if they're actually useful for those things after they've been developed is very helpful. And I agree with your comments about live birth. I, I can understand why they would, you know, choose this endpoint to to look at, but I would agree that is what a patient ultimately cares about. Yeah, I just think that the likelihood of success is a little bit higher because they're not including canceled cycles. So what these data are, are saying is that if you fall into the Bologna criteria for each cycle, you have a 32% chance of having a euploid blast, which sounds really good. However, that's for each cycle that progresses to retrieval. And what is the number needed? You know, what is the number needed? How many cycle starts do you need to get to retrieval in some of these patients who have incredibly poor ovarian response? Is that 
They tried four times. And by the time they made it to retrieval, they finally had a euploid blast. Or is that one cycle? And I think in the strictest cutoff. So the final point I make on this is I think we have still a problem with the classifications. I mean, I get really confused by these different classifications and they're just not harmonized. And I sometimes worry, does that, you know, in general statistical terms, when you blur definitions, you have non-specificity, then everything kind of goes to the null. And I'm just, I'm just frustrated by this, this really important area of of study, but just the literature is just not crisp. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. And I think it's it's really hard to define. Bologna really says, if you're a poor responder, this is what you are. It's incredibly strict, but it's a very, um, it's a very uniform definition and it really holds true. What Poseidon does is it's more nuanced. You have younger age, worse ovarian reserve markers. You've got older age, better res- ovarian reserve markers in some of the categories. And I think at the end of the day, like it really does come down to age and (laughs) the percent likelihood of euploid is constant by age. So if you are 34, it doesn't matter if you have an AMH of 0.1 or 10, the percent embryos that you have that are going to be euploid is constant. Where you see the differences are, is that in that 34 year old with an AMH of 10, you'll probably get 10 blasts in one cycle. And so you'll have a higher number of blasts from which you can then have your euploids, as opposed to somebody who has an AMH of 0.1, you might need multiple cycles to arrive at getting a euploid blast. And so I I don't think that these are that helpful. I do agree from a research perspective, we need to find ways to categorize patients to better randomize patients for treatments and to better understand the science, but it's very tough. And everyone everyone wants their own classification system. It's almost as bad as recurrent implantation failure, Micah, which we've had oh a long boy. discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I like your word of not crisp. I was going to say murky, but not crisp works. That's sort of how I feel about these, <laughs> where, where we don't have clear diagnoses or you know <laughs> clear definitions of what our diagnosis is. It's very hard to synthesize that data cogently. Yeah, great. So definitely interesting paper. I think it'll get a a lot of interest. So please uh, get in uh, to the journal this month and read that. And Eve, we're sticking with you. We're missing our friend Pietra today. So you are up next. We're moving on from ART to the environment. Okay, this is a big one. So before I really dive into this one, I'm just going to quote Kurt and say, this is one where you have to let the data flow over you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> There's a lot in here, and it's a really interesting study, and it provides a lot to think about. But, um, spoiler alert, it leaves me with more questions than answers. The objective of this study was to understand how chronic exposure to, in- to industrial air pollution is associated with male fertility through semen parameters. They used data from the Subfertility Health and Assisted Reproduction Cohort in Utah from 2005 to 2017 for men who had documented infertility undergoing semen analysis where they had record of at least one measured parameter. And if that sounds familiar, it does because the same group has published other studies from the same data set, one that we reviewed a few months ago looking at Area Deprivation Index, which gets incorporated here. So they constructed residential histories for each man through linkage from the Utah population database. And they also looked at industrial facilities with air emissions of nine endocrine disrupting compounds or EDCs. And these were identified from the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency risk screening micro data. And this provides granular estimates of air concentration within a 50 kilometer radius. For our learners, EDCs disrupt hormone regulation or action, and they're thought to compete for binding to or interactions with steroid receptor superfamilies or protein-coupled receptors. EDCs can also alter hormone biosynthesis, transport, or metabolism, or circulating hormone levels. Similar classes were combined to total nine classes of disrupting chemicals, things like bisphenols, organochlorides, and phthalates, to name a few. They took annual data averages, and these were spatially linked to participant residential histories for the five years before semen analysis. Subjects who lived 50 kilometers away from these plants were considered to be unexposed. 
Semen analyses were classified as oligo or azospermic using WHO cutoffs for concentration. They had a total of 21,000 men and nearly 24,000 semen analyses were included and linked to model airborne EDCs. All counties in Utah reported some exposure in the highest quartile, but higher exposures, not surprisingly, were generally linked to those with higher population density. In addition to that, neighborhood socioeconomic disadvantage using ADI or Area Deprivation Index was studied, as I mentioned before. So this is similar data set to what they used previously. And I really look at this study as an extension of that prior study or another piece in the puzzle. Is it socioeconomics or could it be worse air quality that accounts for issues with the semen analysis? And as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of data to unpack in this paper, and I strongly encourage you to read it. And I think specifically look at figure one, which beautifully illustrates the county, the exposures, and the percent of men with fourth quartile or the highest level of exposures. The main finding was that the odds of azospermia and oligospermia significantly increased with exposure to aromatic hydrocarbons, dioxins, organic solvents, organochlorines, phthalates, and silver particles. There were some findings with certain EDCs and concentration on sperm motility as well. I think this is interesting, but I really do have more questions than answers. I think the biggest one is, do people spend most of their time at home? And is home modeling the most effective way to do this? What about work exposures, other exposures, And I think the other questions is, how do we affect change? Should we never be going outside? Should we try to find houses that are far away from industrial plants? Or are we going to go back to a world where people wear N95s all the time when they're outside? It's a little bit scary because you can't really run away from air quality issues. Kurt, Micah, what do you think? I'm fascinated by this topic. I've been asked to give my opinion on some of these you know, exposure trials and how do you interpret this. Some of these are leading to massive lawsuits. Some of these are, I mean, it, it, and it's such a difficult field because it's such a macro problem. This is a nice read. I mean, you, if you're interested in this, read the paper, but to use my own words, you just got to let this flow over you. It's really hard to get a specific recommendation out of this. You know, is there really a link? Is there not a link? Where's the link? So I just compliment the authors for this kind of study and it adds to the literature, I, but I agree with you. It's really hard to put this into a blender and come out with any kind of concrete recommendation. And what's, what uh, scared me about the paper, because I don't normally get impacted by these, was just how strong the effect was. Like it, it was it a was pretty strong effect on the sperm numbers, the strong association, I guess I should say, more than like what I feel like we typically see in a lot of these environmental papers. And so to me, that was striking. Yeah, I'm going to push back on that a little bit because the effect was not stronger. So you know, going back to the previous paper, looking at area deprivation index, and, you know, maybe these are, maybe area deprivation index is really linked to this through air quality, and that may be the missing piece. But it may also be air quality, maybe a confounder. And it may be that in these men who have lots of area deprivation index or who are high on that scale, who have poor socioeconomic status, It may be diet related or smoking related or exposure to highway systems, which have lots of air pollution. And so I think it's just it's really hard to make any conclusions from this paper. Both of you are right in, in, in the general sense. I can't make specific recommendations here. The stronger the effect, the more likely it is to be believable. Because if there is this huge confounding by many other things, not living where you're measuring and all this kind of stuff, it tends to you know bias it all towards the null. But when you do find a significant effect, you got to wonder: is it really you know nothing is causal? I know that, but is it is it really one related to the other, or is there something else here that's just not measured? Fascinating field. I'm glad it's infertility and sterility, but I still don't know what to do about whether we should be shutting down these industrial plants or not. Yeah, and Eve, just to clarify what I meant by that, oftentimes in these sorts of studies, we'll see you know uh, an odds ratio, a relative risk that is close to one. And we look when you look at absolute numbers and sperm, we're talking about hundreds of thousands. You're like, well, clinically, I don't care. Here, some of these things they're talking about seven million, even thirty million differences. Like, if that 
association is there in some way, that's a pretty strong negative association, which then, you know, to me gets this as being um, raising a red flag saying, hey, these are things that we need to do more research on to get to the, okay, so what do we do now? Because the the flag's been raised. Yeah, I get it. I think, and again, this skeptic in me always questions, it's one semen analysis at one point in time. It's been shown that there can be marked fluctuations in semen analyses in the same man on two different samples. And looking backwards, somebody living in one location for five years, um, people move around all the time. And so I'm not certain that the exposure that we're seeing is really reflective of the exposure that that person actually had at all times. And so what percentage are you spending at home? How much of that is sleeping inside your house? How much of that is is doing yard work? And I think the other point that was a little bit scary is this is Utah. Like I'm thinking Utah has pretty clean air relative to where I live in Chicago or where you live in Philly and DC. And so it is a little bit scary to think that if Utah's air is this polluted, it doesn't say much about the rest of us. We have to leave it on that. I mean, there there is no benefit to polluting the air. So we, we can all agree on that. Whether it has a direct effect on sperm counts, we can still debate. Great discussion. Eve, you sounded like me and I sounded more like Kurt on this one this time. So I guess <laughs> it's just the moods that we're in today, but uh, good, good discussion. <laughs> Kurt, uh, you're closing us out with a research letter. I've enjoyed these a lot more than I thought I would since you've you've brought these back. So tell us about the research letter this month. Yeah, this this is a this is I think great example of a research letter. This is a, a small, concise report that probably wouldn't have seen the light of the day if it had gone through, you know, as a full paper because you know the point is really straightforward and there. This is a, a study about oral venerelbine to treat women with ectopic pregnancy, and it's a phase one clinical study for safety and tolerability. Phase one studies are incredibly important. There's a lot of information that's gained, but they they're small, and it's hard to extrapolate it into into big clinical situations, which is why I like this as a research letter. So this is a well-done study performed by a group of investigators out of New Zealand that wants to test if this chemotherapy, which by the way is an anti-mitotic agent, might be better or at least safe and tolerable for the treatment of ectopic pregnancy. I mean, we all know the rationale. Ectopic pregnancy is still common. Um, Many people still treat it. Methotrexate has been around for a long time, but it's you know, it's not easy to give. And, and if there really was an oral medication that could enter into this situation, it would it would be beneficial. I'm just going to interject for one second, though. You can take methotrexate orally. <laughs> yeah. And there are, there are some studies that are pretty weak studies about oral methotrexate that hasn't worked well. So, you know, if you did find a chemotherapy that had a different mechanism of action, although these two actually are pretty similar, you, you know, you might be onto something. And this might be onto something is the whole idea of a phase one trial. And it takes a lot of work to get to this and to put it together and a lot of scrutiny and a lot of oversight. And again, that's why I want the information to see the light of the day. You can tell by the tone of my voice that this isn't probably an overpowering study. You know, this study looked at uh, 32 patients who are eligible in a group of time. And it talks about, you know, that 15 of them had a decrease in their HCG and and very few of them um, had side effects. Some had GI side effects. Only one person had abdominal pain. It talks a little bit about the HCG trends. But overall, you know, nine of 14 patients um, were actually successfully treated. So um, the purpose of the study is to show that this perhaps can be used to move forward to a larger trial or to power a trial. But based on the preliminary results, you can say it's safe and tolerable, but you, I don't think you could say that it's wildly more effective than methotrexate at this point. So the point again is let this literature see the light of day. If it's not published, you know, you'd never would have known somebody tried. There's a nice um, reflections on it by Dr. Levin, which also describes that, you know, we still need treatments for ectopic pregnancy. And this one, you know, has some um, attractive elements. It's interesting though, Micah, we have these research letters that are capped at 650 words, yet we have a 1,500 1, word reflection on the, on the topic. So if you're interested, take a look. <laughs> It's the concept of great idea. People are really doing strong work. I want to compliment for the strong work. It doesn't look like this one's going to change the earth, be earth shattering, but I recognize good science for good science. Yeah, I just want to echo, Kurt. I think this is a great addition to the journal. There's no really other place for these sorts of studies to live, and uh, they need to be seen and published, you know, moving on to phase two. The other research letter is on impact factor. Is there an impact factor bias in RCTs? 
And I thought that one was fascinating. Uh, and it's a, just another example of a, it's a small study. It's pretty simple. They looked at 20 journals or 16 journals and uh, looked to see if positive outcomes versus negative outcomes were more or less likely to be in the higher impact journals. And overall, it was about the same. Uh, but if you looked at the top 75th percentile of studies published in the top journals, they were more likely to be positive, about 10% more likely to be significant, clinically significant outcomes, uh, suggesting maybe impact factor bias, or maybe just those studies are more likely to be submitted to those journals, whether it's bias on the editorial end or on the back end or whether it really exists, I don't know, but it raises the discussion. I think it was an interesting one and a good place for a, a short research letter. Yeah, I waver on this, and, and Mike and even we've talked about this, is that clearly articles in fertility and sterility have to be high quality. They have to be rigorous. The science has to be good. And for our readership, it needs to be topical. We are digesting our information in shorter bites and, and therefore having, you know, these you know, shorter but really intriguing topics appear as a research letter, I, I hope is a, is a benefit. So we'll continue to talk about them on this podcast and publish them in the journal. Thanks as always. Great discussion. And I look forward to seeing you both next month. Awesome. So thank you again to all our readers as we celebrate our third birthday today, entering into the fourth year of Fertility and Sterility on Air. Thank you for all of you listening who make this podcast possible. And in three and a half years, remember, there's a lot of other content. I just listened to the um, podcast from Eshri, and that's a good, really good listen. Congratulations, Eve, for putting that together. But if you really want to get cutting edge information, not only listen to this podcast, but listen to the offshoots that we have. And we hopefully will be interviewing some of you at ASRM this year to share late breaking news as well. All right. We'll see you all next month. This concludes our episode of Fertility and Sterility on Air, brought to you by Fertility and Sterility in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. This episode was produced by Dr. Michael Simone and Dr. Molly Cornfield. This podcast was developed by Fertility and Sterility and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other practicing clinicians. While the podcast reflects the views of the authors and the hosts, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to direct an exclusive course of treatment. The opinions expressed are those of the discussants and do not reflect Fertility and Sterility or the American Society for Reproductive Medicine.